Myanmar is ready for the return of Rohingya, faces 26 armed insurgent groups. Myanmar wants the Rohingya refugees to return, and preparations have been made to receive them, according to the minister in charge of the process. We will accept them back anytime, said Dr. Winmayatai, Myanmar's Minister for Social Welfare, Relief, and Resettlement. Whoever wants to come back voluntarily, we can accept, he said. He also urged Bangladesh to immediately return the 400 or more Hindu refugees who have agreed to be repatriated as this could help kickstart the stalled repatriation program. The minister made his comments in an exclusive interview with the Bangkok Post, amid growing international criticism of Myanmar's repatriation efforts and Bangladesh's accusations that Myanmar is to blame for the failure of the process. But many experts and analysts following developments in Rakhine believe the Myanmar government is in a state of denial, and that conditions in the Rohingya's home state are not yet ready for their safe return. The case. Actually, while we cannot expect the repatriation to start anytime soon, we do want them back as early as possible, said Winmayata. Although it is our strong wish to have the refugees back as early as possible, the process must be voluntary and safe. We've been ready since January last year to take the refugees back, in accordance with the bilateral agreement signed with Bangladesh in November the previous year, he said. Myanmar needs the support of Bangladesh and the UN, for the process to begin, he stressed. More than 750,000 Rohingya as they call themselves fled their villages in Rakhine following a massive military crackdown in August 2017, in response to terrorist attacks by the pro-Rohingya armed group, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, ARSA. Successive UN reports describe what happened during the subsequent military mopping up campaign as textbook ethnic cleansing, while independent international human rights groups claim it has all the hallmarks of genocide. The Myanmar government and the military though have strenuously denied these accusations. Bangladesh blames Myanmar for the repeated failure of the repatriation process to start. We've seen that Myanmar could not win the Rohingya's trust in creating a conducive situation in Rakhine for their dignified return, the Bangladeshi Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, told Parliament recently. We had made full preparations, but still the repatriation did not start, as uncertainty looms over the Rohingya getting back their homes, land, and other properties. When Mayatai of course disagrees, we were actually well prepared to receive the refugees back, in accordance with our bilateral agreement with Bangladesh. There are two reception centers and a transit center ready to receive the refugees as part of a safe and voluntary repatriation. All those who are verified as Myanmar residents in accordance with the procedures agreed with Bangladesh will be welcomed back, he insisted. According to aid workers and experts, one of the issues that needs to be tackled before Myanmar has a hope of attracting large numbers of Rohingya refugees to return is the continued existence of the IDP camps in Rakhine. When Myatai who has previously said closing these camps was a high priority in accordance with the recommendations of the Kofi Annan Rakhine Advisory Commission dodged the question, simply saying it was on the agenda and now part of the newly developed national plan to close all IDP camps nationwide. We cannot focus only on Rakhine state, but must consider Myanmar as a whole, we are working on a plan for Rakhine, Shan, Kachin and Kayan and trying to develop a national strategic plan that will be effective, workable, and cover all Myanmar," said Winmayatai. It's step by step, a systematic approach as far as the camps in Rakhine are concerned that needs time, with access to education and health provided. Although he conceded the time frame was important, he declined to give an exact deadline for the camp's closure. But many experts remain unconvinced that the conditions in fact are conducive for the safe return of the refugees. If Myanmar were able to show that the more than 300,000 Rohingya who are still in Rakhine state now have far better living conditions and rights than two years ago, it might be able to persuade more refugees to return. But it is not able as the situation is as bad or worse than before said Laetitia Van Denisum, a member of the government-appointed Kofi Annan Rakhine Commission. And to make matters worse, large parts of the state remain off-limits for the UN, she added.
Nevertheless, some refugees definitely do want to return, the minister insisted. Some 200 families came back earlier this year under their own steam and are currently in the process of being resettled, he said. They returned secretly, he suggested, because they feared retaliation and violence at the hands of the camp leaders in Bangladesh. Some not all don't feel it is safe to return, because of the influence of some of the camp leaders, and of course ARSIS threats against them if they go back have also frightened them. According to Myanmar government officials in Mongda, 168 male and 290 female Rohingya refugees have returned so far this year and been registered through the official reception centers. UN officials in the Bangladesh camps confidentially told the Bangkok Post that they have several inquiries a week from refugees about repatriation. What the refugees want before repatriation and what would be called conditions conducive to repatriation is not just citizenship but a change of attitude and policies towards them which addresses the root causes of discrimination, Chris Lewa, head of the Urican Project, told the Bangkok Post. In fact, it goes beyond citizenship, and includes the guarantee of human and ethnic rights, she said. But the Myanmar government is adamant the National Verification Card, NVC, is a process that could lead to full citizenship, and in the meantime offers freedom of movement one of the refugees' main concerns. The NVC is the first step in the process of citizenship, said Win Myatai. If they hold this, they will get citizenship according to the law 1982 Citizenship Act Full Citizenship, Naturalist Citizenship, or Associated Citizenship. The NVC ensures freedom of movement, he insisted. But in practice, according to diplomats based in Yangon who frequently visit Rakhine, this is not the case. For Rohingya who have NVCs, like the group in Rakhine's Maiban camp who cannot travel outside the camp nothing has changed, no freedom of movement, no end to apartheid-like conditions, no equality with other ethnic groups, said Ms. Van Denissom. Said the minister, trust building takes time, we are trying, we're not sitting on our hands, we are trying. Peace and stability in Rakhine is our goal, but it takes time. He accepted there was a deep trust deficit on the part of the refugees that had to be addressed. But Myanmar won't even accept the well-intentioned concrete proposal made recently by Chinese diplomats which echo the suggestion made repeatedly by the UN over the past year, that a group of Rohingya leaders and refugees from the camps be allowed to visit Rakhine to investigate the situation there for themselves ahead of possible repatriation. This seems short-sighted on Myanmar's part, but the minister refused to discuss the issue when asked about it by the Bangkok Post. Privately, UN officials and diplomats who support the move say that the Myanmar government is fearful with good reason that if they showed the camp leaders the situation on the ground, it would only harden their resolve not to return. Many in the international community are prepared to assist refugee returns once the conditions for safe and voluntary returns are in place, Ms. Van Denissom told the Bangkok Post. But instead of building trust, the government keeps undermining its own credibility, when time after time its promises and pronouncements are proven to be insincere. Myanmar struggles with 26 armed insurgent groups. Backed by China, Armed separatist groups in Myanmar do have close links with Indian outfits like ULFA2. Myanmar has been condemned worldwide for its actions, with some even calling for UN sanctions. Any prospect of a UN Security Council resolution condemning Myanmar is ruled out, as it will face a certain Chinese veto, possibly with Russian support. While there have been calls for India to expel some 40,000 Rohingya refugees, New Delhi has wisely chosen to seek a negotiated return of refugees to Myanmar, from India and Bangladesh. India has categorically conveyed to Myanmar that it wants the safe, secure and sustainable return of the Rohingya refugees, from both Bangladesh and India. Long Border India shares a sensitive 1,640 km border with Myanmar, across the northeastern states of Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, and Arunachal Pradesh, where armed separatist groups like ULFA are still active. New Delhi has to carefully observe what is happening in Myanmar, as separatist groups across the border tend to cooperate with each other. Far more serious than the Rohingya issue, 
are the challenges that Myanmar faces from 26 armed insurgent groups. Only 17 of these groups have agreed to observe a ceasefire, while the others are still resorting to violence and challenging the writ of the Myanmar government. Aung San Suuki initiated a dialogue with the armed groups in August 2016. Two rounds of talks held with the armed groups have shown very little movement forward. The third round is now in a limbo, because of procedural issues. It is also clear that there are serious differences between the elected government and the powerful armed forces, on the peace dialogue. This deadlock has been accompanied by an extraordinarily active Chinese role to shape events, including in areas close to Myanmar's borders with India. Sun Kyuxiang, China's special envoy on Asian affairs has emerged as a virtual mediator in the peace process with Myanmar armed groups like the Kachin Liberation Army, the Tiang National Liberation Army, the Kakang Alliance Army and powerful United WA State Army, UWSA. All these groups have safe havens in and operate from China's Yunnan province. Ambassador Sun freely travels between Myanmar and Kunming, the capital of the Yunnan province, where he meets representatives of armed separatist groups. Over the years, the UWSA has been permitted to acquire immense firepower in China, including armored vehicles, AK-47 rifles, assault weaponry, and reportedly, even surface-to-air missiles. These groups also raise huge resources from drug smuggling and illegal mining in Myanmar. This Chinese involvement with armed separatist groups in Myanmar has been accompanied by the close links that these groups have with Indian separatist groups like ULFA. These developments have, in turn, been accompanied by the formation of a Myanmar-based grouping of insurgent groups operating in India's northeastern states, labeled as the United National Liberation Front of Western Southeast Asia, UNELFA. The National Socialist Council of Nagaland, KPLANG, ULFA, Kamtapur Liberation Organization and the National Democratic Front of Bodo Land are all members of the UNELFA, which claimed credit for the ambush and killing of 18 Indian soldiers in Manipur. These groups have their links with Chinese-backed groups like Kachin Liberation Army and are known to travel across the Myanmar-China border to the border town of Rulai and Yunnan's provincial capital, Kunming. New Delhi should continue urging Myanmar to act against these Indian insurgent groups and their supporters in Myanmar. There have been instances in the past, when the Indian and Myanmar armies have mounted joint-slash-coordinated operations against such insurgent groups. Most importantly, New Delhi's interlocutor R.N. Ravi should be encouraged to build on progress he has achieved and finalize negotiations to bring the NSCN, IM, into the national mainstream. This will prevent any possibility of other separatist groups receiving support from the highly motivated NSCN, IM, Cotters. Chinese pressures. While Myanmar has resisted Chinese pressures to undertake projects on its soil that face public opposition, like the $6 billion, 6,000 MW Myatsone Dam, China will keep up the pressure to get its way, as it has done in the case of the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. China is in the process of building massive energy, industry, and transport corridors through Myanmar to its landlocked Yunnan province. Beijing is set to invest $7.3 billion in building a deep sea port in Kyokpyu in the Bay of Bengal and $2.7 billion for an industrial park in a special economic zone at Kyokpyu. This port is also the terminal for an oil pipeline and a parallel gas pipeline from Kyokpyu to Kunming, the capital of China's Yunnan province. These projects are designed to bypass the Straits of Malacca, by enabling supply of oil and gas to the landlocked Yunnan province by the pipeline. Moreover, efforts will be made to export Chinese products manufactured in the Kyokpyu Industrial Park to India, while getting duty-free access by benefiting from the free trade agreement between India and Myanmar. India has been relatively modest in its investments in large industrial and infrastructure projects in Myanmar. There has been a successful effort by ONGC in offshore exploration for natural gas. The Institute for Information Technology in Mandalay set up by India has won high praise, as have the skill development centers built with Indian assistance across Myanmar. Indian Development Cooperation also includes an advanced center for agricultural research and education and a trilateral highway linking our northeast to Myanmar and Thailand. 
India also provides funds for developing areas in Myanmar bordering its northeastern states. It has also set up centers for industrial training and learning English, apart from hospitals in Yangon and Sitwe. Moreover, hundreds of Myanmar students study on scholarships and participate in courses in professional institutions in India, under India's technical and economic cooperation programs. One hopes India will respond more imaginatively to facilitate visits by pilgrims from Myanmar to holy Buddhist shrines in India. It is widely acknowledged that while China executes projects expeditiously, India takes an unduly long time to approve and implement development projects. While China may win laurels for its economic and military assistance to Myanmar, its commercial exploitation and crude involvement in Myanmar's internal affairs could lead to a severe backlash, akin to the fury and violence against the Chinese across Myanmar in 1967.